If you know my life, I've had a lot of different things take place, a lot of conflict. Uh, and we have different areas where there's conflict. There's internal conflict. When I was a kid, I had this conflict where I didn't believe that I deserved very much because, well, my mom gave me way into foster care. So I had that internal conflict. There's the interpersonal conflict, right? There's the people that are trying to do things in my life that maybe I don't want them to do, but they know it's better for me. Parents and kids, obviously, or there's people in your own relationships that, you know, there's just that conflict we have. Jenna, you know, alluded to with her relationship as well. Then you have things that are conflicts with, say, nature. Like I got yesterday, my wife FaceTimed me when she was pulling to the house. There was a turkey literally on my truck. And she's like, you better get out of here because this turkey isn't a scratch your truck. It's like there's conflict with nature. Uh, then you have conflict, I believe, with like society. 100% you go places and there are people who are like we have the whole thing of Karens, right? This is just a thing. I'm not saying there's a Karen on here that has that experience, but we have conflict with other people. It's all over the place, right? Conflict is a natural part of life and led me to realize, you know what? I think conflict is necessary. Like it's, it's necessary for growth. It's necessary for us to, to get to a point, I believe, of having success because the next level of what you want is to come outside of your comfort zone. And you're going to have a conflict when you reach that. Even if it's saying, hey, this is what I'm worth pay me this as an employee or as a business owner, no matter what it is, there's going to be a conflict of asking that next step. And so if we don't navigate conflict well, or we completely avoid it, I believe we avoid success. And so when I was thinking through this, I, like, I want to think through different errors and stages and steps where conflict has showed up in my life and how I can give you lessons from the lessons I've extracted. And I love that these topics come in a way for me to actually take a, a moment to pause, go back and go, what in life did I experience that I didn't learn from? Because if you're like me, you've experienced life and you move past it. But a lot of the golden lessons that we really need, they're sitting right there in our memory or in the past or in situations we didn't want to look into or uncover or really spend time in because of the emotional pain of doing so or the thought strife, right? But here's one thing I do believe that, that unfortunately conflict creates disconnection, right? It disconnects you from joy at times. It'll disconnect you from other people, right? It disconnects you from appreciation or perspective, or it can actually disconnect you from the thing we honestly, I think, want most, which is love. And where conflict is necessary, it's also this thing where it can be the thing that disconnects us from some of the things you want. So it's weird because it has this tie to so much in life. And so with this thought, like I, I want us to be able to think about where we can create from conflict, whether it's create moments that are opposite of a hard situation that we're in the middle of right now, or how conflict can create that next thing we want in life. Where's the conflict you should seek, so to speak? I want you to think about in moments in, in life when you've thought about uh, a conflict moment, right? If you show up to a moment, something takes place, what takes over at that moment? Now, usually we will react because the conflict creates an emotion that we're not usually in, whether it's um, anxiety from something taking place and we go to this reactionary situation or we can respond. Now, most people, we react because something happened. I get mad. My emotion flares up when the emotion is high. Well, my intelligence is low and I just start going in the directions and saying certain things. And all of a sudden, I got to breathe and calm and come back to center. And so what I think we should do is take a note that in those moments, ask yourself a simple question, which I help, think helps lead us into response mode, which is, what is this conflict really about? Now, that question may seem simple, but it actually is very powerful in its simplicity because I, I love the statement of no moment has any meaning except the meaning we place upon it. And we are in the middle of a conflict. There's a meaning that initially pops up. So you have this, this strife, this stress that, oh, all of a sudden comes in. And then what we do is we just start reacting to what we believe was taking place in the meaning we gave this moment. For example, uh, my wife, there's times when I was on my phone often in the past in our marriage, and I'm pretty good at not having it around. In fact, oddly, she's the one on her phone more often <laughs> than not nowadays. But I was on, and she used to be like, why are you on the phone? Can you get off the phone? And it created this conflict, and I kept thinking she just didn't want me to be doing my work. I was like, I do my work, but it wasn't actually the real conflict. The real conflict was she felt second place to my phone. Right. And so what happened is I had created this meaning of, well, this is my work. You don't support my work because you don't let me work when I need to work because my phone is my work. And it had nothing to do with that. And so I was creating this conflict, this moment, this argument out of the reality of it was a meaning that was poorly placed by me. The true meaning of what the situation was, was she just wanted her quality time. It's one of her five love languages. And so as you start thinking about moments, take a note and say in the middle of this, when it's rearing its head, to pause, to breathe, to not step immediately into a moment and go, hey, what is this conflict really about? 
right? Maybe someone is asking for a raise and you're an employee or employer, sorry, and, and they want to raise and your thought is they, they come at a certain direction and maybe that the meaning is they want more money because they think that you're undervaluing them and whatever it may be. But the reality might be if their parent is sick and they have to find a way to make more revenue or income to pay for some bills or something happened at home that they need to cover, right? There's going to be a deeper meaning if you can pause and either ask this person, hey, what's the real issue going on? Or think about what a different situation is. It helps alleviate the initial, we'll call it abruptness of what's going on and the intensity that unfolds from that moment. So the first thing I would have you do is ask in moments of conflict, what is this conflict really about? And give yourself space to step out of it and look at it with a separate eye, a little bit of a different perspective, because in doing so, it'll give you a different view. But if you don't go looking for it, it's not just going to pop up in front of your face, right? So in those moments, think about it. Uh, next, do I want or need to get involved in the conflict? This is, this is one that I don't think enough people ask, because a lot of the times we don't need to get involved with things. Who's ever been scrolling on social media and you see something happen, there's a comment or a post and we go, oh, I'm going to give my two cents. And you do. And next thing you know, you're in the next like three hours, it's back and forth battle on social media. And you're like, I didn't need to join that in the first place. I ask this question often. My wife doesn't. She likes to like stoke fires. It's hilarious when she sends me pictures. But the idea is sometimes we don't need to get into the conflict in the first place because one of two things is a situation here. One, it isn't going to better my life. I'm not going to improve my world by being in this conflict sometimes, right? It, now, maybe you will. Maybe it's something you do have to get into. That's a different you know, discussion point. But this one is, Sometimes there are points of conflict that we see that are making us feel a certain way, and we believe we have to step in, and you really do not have to, because you're not asking the question of what's this going to turn into. It's the here and now, it's the emotion of it, and if you just stop and go, you know what? Okay, I don't actually have to comment because this person was wrong about this statement. It, they don't, they're not, because they're not going to actually care, you know? It's the thing, is sometimes we step into things not realizing they're not going to care anything you have to say. So the reality is sometimes we can stop and go, do I need to get involved in this? And the answer is no, and you move on with your life. The situation of confidence is an up and down, it's a bubble. It's an up and down bubble. Sometimes it bursts, sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small. But the truth of the matter is, is it's a matter of how you choose to see it in the moments. And if you are more cognitively aware of how your brain processes, I promise you can get better control of it. And you can understand how to control it in a way that allows you to actually utilize it. This is what's called the self-mastery sequence. And this is a sequence of how our brain like honestly processes all throughout the day. What I want to do is teach you how if you see the, the flow of this, you can actually control it in a way that allows you to have a better base and gauge on moments that are difficult and how you can do the hard things when you need to, to then spin things up the right way. So at the very top of this is going to be what I call identity anchors. So what this is, I'm a guy that operates an identity. I want to get to the point where the things that are difficult, I do like their second nature. I call it rhythm. Like it's more of like, think about the daily operational rhythm. And I don't mean your routines. I mean the rhythm of how you flow. Now we have a certain level of confidence, but there are certain moments that press and test this confidence. So it becomes difficult for us to press to the next tier, right? So the very top, what ends up happening is you currently have an identity. If I asked you, hey, who are you? You tell me something. And you go to a part of your brain that says, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a coach, I'm a speaker, I'm, I'm a, a, a parent, um, I'm a brother, sister, cousin, I'm a, I'm a manager, I'm a CEO, whatever it is, there's a part of you that says, this is who I am, right? It's built around confidence, usually from your past success. Now, there's also things you don't have confidence in. Part of those anchors may be like, hey, I'm not the greatest reader. I'm not the greatest writer. I'm not the greatest X, Y, or Z. And you've also created an identity around that. You've actually spoken things into existence in ways that probably shouldn't be because the reality is when you speak something into existence, you will live in a way to make that right, right? So your identity is what you have in place. Now, this leads to the next piece, which goes to the right. And this is what we call our beliefs. Now, based on your identity, you have certain beliefs that are in line with this and you operate from daily without even realizing it. These beliefs were put in place a long time ago. Um, there's, there's a lot of different studies on this, but Eric Erickson has a, a study in a kind of a structure of the psychosocial aspects. And what he looks at is there's an area between like the age of like 18 to 21, where we have this issue between our, our role and our identity. It's actually called identity versus role confusion. And what ends up happening is you know who you are, but now your role in society becomes a little bit, you know, kind of distant because you're entering it 
now as an adult, right? I'm a kid hanging my parents and all of a sudden I know who I am. Then I'm thrust into this world where like, I now have to operate as an autonomous human by myself. And I don't know who I am or where I fit and how this works. And what's crazy is we've already entered that world with certain beliefs based on who we are, right? So this belief system, if I don't have a belief that I'm capable, that I'm strong, if, my, if I kick my kids out of the house at 18 and I haven't helped them have an identity of strong, confident, powerful, whatever it is, they'll go into that world with an identity that's weak and they'll be confused as they look at the world. And the problem is if nobody goes at any point in time and adjusts this or grows, growth day, right? I end up living this cycle the rest of my life. So you got to take a look at what are the beliefs that I have, the belief systems I have in place, and you have to actually take a look at what are they? What do you believe is possible for yourself or impossible for yourself? Now, beliefs go to another piece, which is very interesting, and we have these all the time. These are called our thoughts, and these bad boys run. They're always running. I, mine are running right now because I can't see your faces. My thought is like, do they like this? Is this any good? I don't know. I'm talking really loud in my microphone. I hope they like it, right? There's a thought going all the time, right? And you guys have also the same kind of thoughts that are conscious and subconscious thoughts. And these root from the beliefs. If we have a belief system that, that's out of whack and not controlled, we'll have thoughts that put us in a depression, that put us in anxiety, that just they just take off and we can't control them. And you just because it's rooted in some belief system that I believe is who I am and I can't adjust it, right? So beliefs go to thoughts. Now, thoughts... They create something unique that I wish we could control, but we can't always control it. And this is the area of emotions. Now, emotions are very interesting because they happen. Like we have them. Uh, my wife has them and she, I can't control them. <laughs> if anybody's married, it's hard to control the emotions of other human that's in your house. And I just have to control my emotions when she has her emotions in place doing her thing. And you get that if you're in a relationship or ever have been and you're human, you probably have, but you know what I mean, right? And what happens is unique in the area of when I have these thoughts, they feed and fuel my emotions. For example, uh, if I'm in a situation where somebody cuts me off in a car, right, and I'm just driving, my thought is they don't like me What bad people. My emotions get enraged and I freak out. Ah, these people, how can they cut me off, right? But what if I have a thought in my head that says they might be in a rush to get to somebody who needs help? Different kind of emotion that would come from that thought, right? It's a complete different thing. And so what happens is if we have control of our thoughts a little bit more, we can actually have control of our emotions. And what happens from the emotions, these emotions lead to our actions. And the actions are interesting. So what happens here is I have found that whenever we have these moments in our life, typically our emotions fuel the actions and actions are driven by the emotional aspect of how we feel in the moment. If I feel amazing, I'll take a bold, powerful, amazing action. If I don't, if I believe I'm not smart and I tell myself I'm not smart, my, my emotions are like, oh, a little detriment, like I feel bad. And then I take kind of a halfway action. This happens for us in life consistently. The emotions fuel the actions and we all live in actions. Like no matter what it is, you had taken the action to be here right now to hang out with me and Brendan and the rest of the crew. This is an action for improvement, right? You had an identity that said, look, I know who I am, but I want to be better. I believe I can be better. My thoughts are like, I'm going to go and take an advantage of this opportunity to actually be part of growth day. My emotions are like, yeah, I can't wait to get there. The action I took after that was like, let's do it. And I'm here, right? Your outcomes are the results of the actions you took based on the emotions, from the thoughts, from the beliefs, from the identity, right? And the outcomes could be good, could be bad, no matter what they are, they are the result of the action you took. So if you take a great, amazing, bold action, great, amazing outcome, right? If you take a crappy halfway action, usually crappy halfway outcome. So if you're like, I tried to do it, Anthony, I really tried really hard to, to eat healthy, well, did you really, right? Because at the end of the day, if you took the action properly, bold, strong, with discipline dialed in, the outcome is you're in better shape. If you kind of a little bit do it, and I just, I cheat and I binge eat at 12 o'clock at night, I'm, ah, you know, well, the outcome is not going to be what you want it to be. If you kind of read the book, but you don't, you know, really take the action of, of you know, kind of reading deeply and really understanding it, the outcome is, I don't know the information, right? Maybe you kind of decide to launch your podcast, a little bit of action, or you really do launch that, right? There's a lot of different areas where people don't realize an action has levels. You can boldly go and do that thing at, at beyond the space what feels comfortable and have an amazing outcome or halfway, have a halfway outcome. Now, the outcomes lead to something special and unique, uh, which really is unique. It's going to be your environment. This is going to be internal and external. Now, the reason we have both of these because they give us feedback that lead over to our identity. And here is why. Whenever I look at the aspect of like my internal environments, if I have an amazing, powerful action I take and then the outcome is amazing and powerful, my internal environment is like, oh, man, I feel great. Look at me. I'm cool. I'm doing great, right? If I take an action that's halfway and the outcome's halfway, well, then my internal environment's like, oh, 
man, that feels bad, right? And on top of that, I create an external environment, right? If I'm joyous and happy and in a great mood, my external environment is I got great friends, part of a great community like Growth Day. I get to you know, go do cool, amazing things, right? And at the same capacity, I maybe I make more money. Maybe I have more time and maybe I have a better house and I take more trips, right? My external environment is better because of the action I took that had a better outcome that it gives me a different environment of how I feel inside and what I see outside. And what you have environmentally, it creates your anchors. Here's what I know a lot of people struggle with. I owned a gym for a long time trained a lot of individuals, moms, dads, athletes. One of the biggest things people want to figure out how to do is how do I get in better shape? How do I lose fat? How do I gain muscle? How do I, how do I, how do I? And today I'm going to give you guys some insights on how to do that from a physiological standpoint. So logic comes in. It's not this, well, my mom's sister's cousin took this pill that she found on the street one day. Like we're not going to go off in some tangent. Okay. And I'm not going to talk about nutrition because that's something you should consult your doctor about or find somebody who can help you there. Here's what I will say about nutrition. Stop eating trash. There you go. Hey, we got a solution, right? If you go into the grocery store, don't go searching in the areas that are the middle of aisles or the middle of the grocery store. Go to the outsides, the upper and the lower. Why? Because the companies that want you to eat the garbage food, they pay a lot of money to be in that middle aisle. So when you go into the store, if you're like, Anthony, I don't know what to eat, eat the things you're not currently eating if you're unhealthy. Ready? We, we solved that one? Good. Look at it. Moving on. So here's what we're going to talk about. There is this concept uh, around like fat loss that most people don't grasp. And, and, and if you actually, what I'm going to teach, if you understand this, you're going to understand why and see why certain programs and training methodologies have worked for people to get strong, to get, um, to lose weight, all that stuff. So if you've had like these, these troublesome abilities to lose weight and all that kind of fun stuff, you will understand how the body works right now. So first things first, you have to find something you like to do. I'm going to preface this. When it comes to exercise, the biggest, I think, issue that people run into is they, they go and find, well, Susan across the street and Nick down the street, well, they got treadmills and he has a kettlebell. I'm going to go buy a kettlebell. I'm going to go buy a treadmill. You know what it becomes? The treadmill becomes a very expensive clothes hanger in your garage. And I guarantee somebody right now has one of these things sitting there. Why? Because you don't like running. So don't go run. And you could go run outside, by the way. So find something you love to do. This comes a trial and error, right? Find an actual exercise you enjoy doing. So it's not a chore. It will be hard, but it doesn't need to be a chore. Now, as we progress, I'm going to talk to you about what's called the three areas or the trifecta of fat loss. And this actually is, it's scientifically proven. This isn't some bro science. I'm not making something up here. You'll understand how it works. So here is the first stage and how our body will actually help us burn calories. Have you guys ever heard of the concept of um, fast twitch, slow twitch muscle fiber? Anybody heard of this before? Beautiful. There's actually multiple different fiber types. I want to say around five or six, but we just simplify and go fast twitch, slow twitch. The difference is fast twitch muscle fiber. I, it's going to draw a lot of energy. I can use it for a short amount of time, but I'm a fatigue quick. This is going to be like sprinting, lifting heavy weights, that kind of stuff. Slow twitch says, look, I don't have a lot of power, and I don't take a lot of drain, like I don't pull a lot of calories, but I can go for a long time. This is jogging. This is going for walks. This is movement over any kind of distance that's not at max effort around like 30 seconds plus. Now, we're not going into energy systems today. Whole different conversation. Just keep in mind, fast twitch, slow twitch. So what the science shows is that I can go in and say I did a slow twitch muscle fiber workout that took me an hour to get done and I burned maybe 500 calories. What happens for us is two things here. One is I'm burning calories and it feels great. But then when I'm off the treadmill or I'm off walking, my body stops burning calories. It's a problem. It's good, but like I'm only sore for a little bit. I got to sweat on and I'm good and I stop burning calories, which is, it's not beneficial. There's ways you can fix this, right? But the idea is like, I, I did a whole workout. I want to have some added benefits. This is why it's called fast twitch muscle workouts come into play. And there's multiple kinds of ways to do it. This is anything that's full exertion for you. This could be a sprint. It's lifting weights. This is why CrossFitters do this stuff, high intensity. And here's why. In an hour's workout, if I did it in a slow twitch and I burned 500 calories, follow me with the math, people. I could actually work out 30 minutes, half the time, and burn those 500 calories with fast twitch. So what I'm saying is you can burn the same amount of calories and less time, sometimes more, in fact, in less time. This is why people who are seem to be in crazy good shape, where are they always at? They're in the weight room. Do you know why gyms have cardio theaters with TV screens and cool little stuff? Because they know that if they get you to come hang out there, you're not going to get in shape. So guess we have to keep going to the gym. 
consistently for years. It's a business. They want to make money. They make beautiful cardio theaters. They tuck the gym rats in the corner, but those people look like they're in the best shape because the workouts that they're doing. Now, you do not have to go do their workouts. Everything has a progression. Again, choose something that resonates with what you like to do. Hire somebody who knows more about it than you know about it, but find someone and find workouts that will allow you to burn more calories in less time. And then here's why the benefit is. When you get done doing a fast twitch exertion kind of workout, you in fact burn calories up to 42 hours past your workout. This is the second stage of the trifecta. Who's ever lifted weights or done some runs or, and got sore like for like five days and couldn't walk? Yeah, 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 I got the hands up, right? That's because your body's still recovering. So what happens is my body is still moving, it's still recovering, I'm sleeping, it's still burning calories. So a treadmill, getting off a treadmill, I got a good sweat, I got hot, good for cardio, helps the heart, but it's not gonna help me burn fat, not gonna help me tone muscle, Right. So the idea is like if you really want to burn some fat, tone, build some muscle, the idea isn't to do a treadmill. It's to do something that's a little bit heavier weights than you're used to doing at your own relative level. And then the in-between portion when the body is recovering, you're still burning calories. Now, here's the third piece that few people think about. And here's why individuals who start out with workout routines, they get to that point of like, I've been working out for a month and I got no results. Back to their burritos. Like we just like, it didn't work. I'm just gonna go and you know, back and eat some. Cause we get, we're like, it's not working. And here's why. What happens in the third stage of the trifecta is called a resting metabolic rate, RMR. Right now, every single person on here has a metabolic rate at rest, which means sitting here, while you're sitting here, you're burning calories. You're burning calories while you, while you sleep, you're burning calories in any way. Just sitting here, your body is churning. It's why your body gets hungry, right? If you just sat into nothing, you'd at least get hungry. Body's still doing something, right? And here's the unique thing. The more lean muscle mass you have on your body, the higher your resting metabolic rate, the higher your body's rate of burning calories is at rest, which allows you to work out. So if I work out with heavy weights, I'm burning more calories in less time. I'm then having the in-between of recovery still burning calories. And then once I've recovered, I have that nice, fresh, lean muscle. I'm burning more calories at rest doing nothing. So when I talk about the ramp up that first month, your body hasn't got all three tiers ticked in yet. Most people just stop too early. They say, well, this isn't working. I've done it for 30 days. It's not going on, right? And what happens is because you didn't let the body get past the sore point, get to the point of having lean muscle. So here's what happens. When I got more lean muscle, what can I do? Well, I'm a little bit stronger. I'm, I got less body weight. I can do a harder, heavier workout. Maybe I can do some pull-ups now. I can do heavier weights. So I, I degrade the muscle even more and I have to recover even more. And then I got more muscle and I'm stronger. So I can actually lift heavier weights and I can do harder workout. See how it works? So the whole role for people that want to build muscle and burn fat, it's not only the nutrition. That's a huge piece because you have to have the right nutrition in order to actually get a good workout in. I need, I need, actually, I took Brendan's Optimize today, right? You got to have good things in your body. On top of that, you've got to have the ability for yourself to recover in between with the right nutrients. And you have to have the right stuff in your body to actually maintain that lean muscle mass. So the whole trifecta works in this way. And so what you have to do is give your body time to catch up. And then all of a sudden, it'll start shedding fat and building muscle like crazy because it gets past those intro ramp up points. So for example, if anybody has been on my Instagram anytime in the last, I don't know, uh, like five months or something, when I started the beginning of this year, I was a little bit, a lot of bit bigger than I should have been. I, uh, I didn't have any speed, D Brennan, I couldn't go on Brennan's stage, so I didn't have any reason to get in shape. So I was at home just eating up that healthy food. It was so good. Holidays, I had to see anybody. Oh, you guys, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I just ate a bunch of food. And let's give you a little bit of a, a reference. When I was playing in the NFL, I weighed at most 240 pounds and I had 12% body fat. When I weighed in on December 31st of 2020, I weighed 250 pounds and I was about 27% body fat, 25, 27. Yeah, yes, I'm, yes. I don't, I'm not there now. I lost it. I lost it. All right. So, so I, at the beginning of the year, I was like, I got to do something about this. So I started this program and I wanted to lose a bunch of weight. I was like, I got to get the weight back down, but the muscle back up. I know that guy's in there, just like you. The body is in there for yourself. And I knew this in my head, how this works. So the first few weeks, I'm building. I'm doing hard workouts and I'm dying, by the way. Like, I, I'm not as young as I used to be. My body knows that. And the recovery, I had to eat the right food, that I had to keep drinking water, and I would be sore. I, would, I wasn't going, right? In the first probably 30 days, I might have lost maybe 10 pounds, maybe 10 pounds. 
from the next 30, from that 30 days to the next 45 days, that window, I lost 27 more pounds. It wasn't the beginning. It doesn't happen at first. It doesn't happen immediately, right? And I sell this stuff so you get a grasp of like, it takes time. And what's unique about this is like the body will ramp up and then here's what's crazy. It's actually harder for me right now to gain weight. I've tried to eat some stuff. I can't, I can't get, I actually got down so low. I was like, I got to get back. But my body is churning so fast. The, the resting metabolic rate, it's, it's hard to get back. Today, we're going to talk about the way that I look at mindset and resilience. So here's the big thing. Our mindset is, is included within who we are and our identity. And I'm going to extract for you guys something that I, I talk and walk through called the slower go identity grid. And the slower go grids, and I'll let you see in a simple way, like where you stand right now. Some of you might have heard it before. Maybe you've taken the quiz. Maybe you've not. And hopefully you haven't all heard of it because that'd be kind of like, oh, I'm going to do the same thing. But I promise even if you have I'll give you a little bit more depth to it. So here's what I want you to grasp. We all have the clear understanding of what a mindset is. However, sometimes we may not understand the inner workings of it or who we are with it. And so we're going to break this down today. I'm going to show you how you are essentially one of four different kinds of identities harboring certain mindsets. Now, as I tell you this, I want you to grasp it doesn't really mean that if you see one that's like not perfect, you say like, oh, it sounds like me. It's not the end of the world. That's the beautiful part about who we are. We can always adjust and grow and change, right? We have neuroplasticity in our brains. We can learn new things. Yes, you can teach an old dog new tricks, no matter what they say. There's a Netflix show I saw about it. Just so you know, like, really, you can actually teach an old dog new tricks. But we're going to actually teach you guys some cool things. So let's get into this without me talking about it all day. We're going to go over this. Now, in our lives, we always have these different aspects of opportunity and opposition. And to be quite honest, they have this intersection point. They always meet each other, if you think about it. There's always this opportunity of something, but it's always like the, oh, but it ain't perfect, right? And I find that as we go through things, we're always trying to figure out like, okay, where do we stand? What do we do? And how do we make the next moments of our lives better? However, how we show up in those moments, those defining moments, those will determine how the next moments are better or not. And so now I'm going to talk you through four different types of mental framings and identities that have mindsets to them, right? Of how I think. And I want you to figure out which one you are. So the first one we're going to talk about is a dreamer. Now, think about opportunity and opposition. Now, if I'm a person that when opportunity comes to pass and I sit there and I look at it and I go, oh, it'd be amazing to chase the opportunity, but I go, oh, I don't know if I should and maybe I can and I stew on it for too long. What happens opportunity? It leaves. When I was in college, my college coach, he says, hey, if our opportunity comes knocking at your door, you better open the door, put, pull him inside, sit him down, get him dinner, make him stay a while. Because if he leaves, we don't know when he's coming back around again. And so the idea is like when opportunity comes, how do you handle it? And some people, we get so apprehensive. We get so processing. We, we get to the point of just paralyzation by overanalyzation that we don't take opportunity and actually capitalize on it. And at the same time, these same people, they're not really good in opposition. Like when something pops up and rears its head, we question ourselves. My mindset goes, I don't know if I can, if I'm capable, if I'm smart enough. And so what ends up happening is I go, oh, I don't know. And then I just, I end up moving myself back. I find ways to reverse my path. I will make excuses. I will procrastinate. I'll call myself perfectionist. I'll say, I'm a perfectionist. No, you're just scared of putting it out there. Let's be honest, right? There's this aspect of like the opposition. It makes me feel scared. So what do I do? I'm always telling people about my dreams. I'm dreaming about this. I'm going to do this. I can do this. I can create this. And an opportunity comes. They go, why didn't you take advantage of it? Oh, well, you know, this happened and I didn't have enough time and I was too busy or, you know, I just, I didn't know much about it or I, we make excuses. And no matter what the excuse, good or bad, it still is an excuse that's stopping you from getting what you want. So that's the first one, a dreamer, someone who doesn't over like go into the space of taking on opportunity because they're fearful and those who are not good at tackling opposition. Now, the next person is called a dabbler. A dabbler is someone that says, look, when an opportunity comes up, I'm taking it. Yeah, put me in coach, buy all the Dogecoin and the different uh, Bitcoin thing. I'm buying all of it. Let me go do it, right? And then maybe it's not that, but maybe it's opportunities that come rise and they go after them full speed. They invest in these things. They buy these things. They, they go and start these processes. They do stuff. But here's what happens. The moment opposition comes, they shut down. 
it's too hard. I don't know how to do this. I'm a little bit fearful. I'm scared. And what I do is I, again, I pull myself away. I may have started down that path. The moment it got hard, I stopped my progress and I stayed stagnant or went backwards. This happens for a lot of people. They try some, I want to do live streams and I want to do webinars and I want to write this book. And then I go, it's opportunity to do something. And all of a sudden it gets hard and I go, oh, I don't want to do this. I pull away. And these are what we call the dabblers or shiny object people. Sound familiar? A little bit. Maybe you might, you might even be able to say that, that sounds like me. I try things a lot. I'm excited about new things. And people are like, they're around my life. They'll maybe consistently see I'm always excited about something new. Every week, it's something new with you, Karen and Susan and Nick and Sean and Sherry. It's always something new with you. Yeah, yeah, it is something new because you're a dabbler. Now, again, not the end of the world, but at least maybe you know who you are. And we'll talk about how to be able to make these shifts quickly in the mindset and the identity. The next one, the defender. Now, they in the past have taken some opportunities because we don't take no opportunities, right? We have taken some opportunities. And then what happens is I step forward and I go, look, I'm going to I'm going to have some success. I've had some success and I'm really good at tackling opposition. If it rears its head, I'm shutting it down. I'm going to knock it out. I got this covered. However, if a new opportunity comes to pass, I'm very, very apprehensive because it could take away from my current success. This is the undefeated boxer. The person who's always had a great business, never lost a client. These people, they will not take opportunity because what if it sullies up what I've got? And so what they do is they live a stagnant, boxed in life. Brennan would call it partly the caged life, right? Because now what happens is I've, I've had this success and I don't want any of this to go away. So I don't want anything to come in and possibly mess this up or make me look bad. So I don't want to be embarrassed. So I don't take advantage of new opportunities. But if you, hey, lo and behold, if you ever decide to take, take away what I already got, I'm fighting you for it. Don't you dare say I'm not this or not this or not this. I'll fight to hold my space, but I won't fight for more, right? There's a difference, there's a separation. And so that's a defender. They hold their ground, they stay their pace and they watch life, unfortunately, pass them by. And it sucks. I, I know people like this. They're like, no, no, I got this. I don't want to do anything. I'm like, oh, but you could have done this, this, and I'm happy. Yeah, but there's always a level of happy above the level you're at now if you choose to seek opportunities. Now, the fourth one, which is the one that I have a belief that a, a fair majority of you 100% have to have a piece of at times. And just keep in mind, we have multiple identities and mindsets that sit in different spaces. So if you happen to be one of these, you can be like, hey, I'm a dabbler. You may not be a dabbler everywhere. You might be a dabbler in work. You might be a defender in relationship. I would hope that you are because a defender in relationship means you're great in the one you're at. You don't want to seek more opportunities. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, that's not a good thing. <laughs> don't do that. But you might also be a dreamer in the aspect of hobbies. Like, I want to go be a skydiving coach. No, I don't. But that could be a dreaming idea, right? You see what I'm saying? Multiple identities. So I believe in your personal growth, a lot of you guys fit into this space right here. It's called a doer. So a doer is someone that says, look, I love opportunity. I seek it out. I want to find out what's new. I want to read the books. I want to get into the programs. I want to join Growth Day. I want to get these. I want to do it all. I want to try it all. And here's why. Because you know that if you chase down an opportunity, inevitably, there will be opposition. But within the opposition, you have the ability and you know you'll take it on. You'll, you'll go fight hard. So you're like, I'm taking it on because I know if I go in this opportunity, I'm going to keep going because I handle opposition well. And then you know that if you face opposition, it's okay because here's the truth. What high performers and growth dayers, I know you guys know this. If you are a person that can handle opposition, you know that opposition, when overcome, creates new opportunities. Every time. I don't care who you are, but if you have a problem, you solve it. You have a new set of tools, which means a new opportunity has placed itself in your life. It's literally how it all, I tell people that when you're in the realm of like what I do, coaching, my job is to create new problems for you. What do you mean, Anthony? Well, if I solve the problem and help you be happier, more joyous, maybe make some more money, well, now you have a new problem of, okay, how do I, what do I do with my taxes? What do I buy? What do I invest? You know what I'm saying? It is new problems. Interesting way to look at it. But those who are doers, they will go after opportunity or go after opposition because they know it actually benefits synergistically. Now, there's different levels of doers. In my experience, we don't like hanging out with dreamers. I don't want to know what you're going to do. I want to know what you've done. And it's not a bad thing at the end of the world, but just be aware of this. Hey, everybody. 
Good day. I'm excited about today's topic because I think there is something to this that we don't always have the opportunity to explore. So I get to let you in a little bit on Anthony uh, and how I flow. Uh, so let's get into this today. So first thing I want to talk about is uh, there are moments in time when everything seems to be hitting us difficult and we get what I call as this kind of spun up feeling. Like that feeling of like anxiety and anxiousness and pressure and there's a lot to get done, not enough time to get it done and I feel like I'm all crazy. There is no calm. They say zero chill is what my son says. You got zero chill today, bro. I, I, I got chill, dad. I just, today's the day I got to get some things done. So there's this idea of like zero chill and I think that there are people that I sometimes hang out with that um that I, I I'll say this and it's funny me and Brendan actually we we had mentioned at a conversation about this in Wyoming of all places years ago and I was driving and I said something along the lines of it's hard to be around people who aren't settled inside repeat this it is hard to be around human beings who are not settled because there's no peace like I can sit there and they're always chatting and they're talking and they're moving and there's there's a vibration I feel I'm like man you're you're unsettling me and the thing is we typically don't even notice that it's happening we just feel anxious around that person we say I don't like that person no you may not like that that they're kind of unsettled they might be a great human but they're a little bit unsettled and what happens is here's a unique thing they are unaware that they're unsettled inside too they're just talking and chatting and doing and that. And it's like, oh, weird energy, right? Sometimes I'll tell you, this is us. And I think when we don't realize that, we wonder why is it hard to, to build the business, to make the sales, to fix the relationship, to be a present father, or to be a good son or be a good brother or sister. It's difficult because like we are creating this vibration of energy around us that is not the most positive simply because we aren't settled inside. We aren't calm. We don't do things with a calm, I call it calm power which I'll talk about in a moment. And then what ends up happening is we can't be productive because we're never online. We're never on track. And if we fall off, we stay off and it just kind of sucks, right? So how do we get to this point of having this space of, of being calm and striving and productive? And I'm gonna cover all those things today. So I wanna take you back to, to the years whenever I was in a space of playing for the Washington Redskins. Now the Washington football team, uh, back, back in the day when I was a young man with less gray hairs and my knees didn't pop when I stood up for some sitting too long. Cause those things, they pop, man, those knees, they start hurting after a while. So what I found was I, I met this guy named Eddie and Eddie did a lot of training. Like he was a, a guy who trained a lot of athletes. He had played linebacker for the Redskins before me. And we got to talking and conversating and he really liked me. He goes, man, I really like you. I go, what, what is it that you like? Cause we, I would worked out I'd only one time worked out with him. And he goes, there's a sense of like this, this, um, this power you carry about yourself. And he says, it's like a calm power. I was like, expand upon this, because I don't know what you're talking about, a calm power. He's like, there's a sense of like, you know who you are, you like what you do, because it's apparent, and it's like, you do it without needing people to give you praise or lift you up all the time, like you do it, and it's powerful. He's like, it, it draws human beings in. I think about when you walk into a room and you see someone who carries themselves that calm power. We're drawn to them. There's a sense of like, that's, I want to, I want to be in their conversation. I want to hover around their little corner. I want to, I want to be in their vicinity because what they give off, I like, right? And there's a sense of calm power. And I, I was like, well, have you noticed that anybody else is like, yeah, I've seen some people. I was like, well, what do you think it is? What's the unique maybe parts of it? He says, well, when I see you show up in the actions you take, you don't take them in a sense of taking them and then turn around going, was it good enough? Was it good enough? Was it good enough? He's like, you take it but you're powerful in knowing that you took it and it's, it's good because you did it, right? He says also, when I'm, and this is mostly in the weight room and getting to know him a little bit later. He says also, whenever I see you show up, he says, you come in joy. It's hard to be in joy if you aren't calm and centered inside. Like it's hard to be in a space of ha. Huh. And if it is, if it's joy, it's like an anxious joy. Like, yeah, 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 I'm happy. Uh, I'm excited. You know, it's like, it's not that like, yeah, I'm happy. I'm joyful. How you doing today? Like, you wanna go get a meal? Wanna get some, like it's a different sense of joy. So my goal has always been like, how do I carry and hold the calm power? How do I continue to put that into the world? Like, how do I, and I show up like this. I, I find that a lot of people that come around me and my purpose when I live my life is I want you to leave my vicinity better. If you ever see me on stage when I go speak, I want my time spent with you to land in your heart and for you to walk away better with the time we spent. If you come to my home, if you come to my, if you're with me, I want there to be a conversation, a flow where you feel like you left and like you're better. And the only way I can give you some is if I have something to give. And if I don't work on giving it to myself, I can't give it to you. And if you don't work on giving it to yourself, you can't give it to anybody else. 
So how do we create this calm? We're going to talk about this. And I, I think that there's some, some things we'll talk about that may uh, kind of maybe unsettle some people. I might poke some areas. I might tweak a little strings. I'm, I'm going to be honest. That's kind of the purpose of today, right? Is to get you guys to see something you haven't seen so you can work on something you haven't worked on. So as we move forward, here's the thing. I want us to talk about what I call is the, uh, the multitasking monkey mind. That's why I think we don't get calm. It's the multitasking monkey mind of all the things I got to get done and they got to get done right now. And, and if I don't get it done right now, someone's going to be mad. Oh, and it goes crazy. And we spin up and spin up. I met with this one guy and I had this moment where after, after football, I went, you know, did my thing, came back home and I was building this business. And it was a gym business back in the day. And I wanted to build this business. I wanted to be amazing. And I was everything all in on this business. And I got to this point where I wouldn't say I'm proud of this, but I would be with my kids and I would want to want to be with my kids. Let me repeat this. I would want to want to be with my kids. And I'm not proud of this because I was with them. I'd play games, but my brain was somewhere else. My multitasking monkey mind was hopping from branch to branch on with the book and then the course and the program and then write this and read this. And you can do this. And you should go with this person and it had this networking with this podcast, built the podcast. Maybe I should make this little image and take this picture oh, everywhere. And so when I'm with my kids, I'm not with my kids and my college coach. I love this. It was big because we were student athletes, college athletes. You know, we're thinking about stuff back in the day. You know, I'm like, I want to get these new shoes and my girl and, and the game. And he's like, hey, be where you are when you are. And that was really hard for me. And I always have come back to that. But I was with my kids. I, I wasn't there with them. And I started realizing that, like, I just had this anxiousness to get it all done. And I kept telling people, I just need one more month. I just need two more weeks. I just need one more year. Right. Ever said it before? I'm going to get it like a hand up if you had it before to somebody else. Like, I just, yeah, I just need one more month, love. I need one more week, love. Give me one more year. I got this. Right. And what happens is that month, that year, that week goes by and we're not aware of it, but we didn't get that thing done. But guess what? They are 100% aware. They'll let you know, like you said, a month. Two months ago, <laughs> why isn't it? What are you doing right now? And what I found was someone gave me this amazing advice. And what they said is, if I was to lock you in a room for 30 days, you would come out of that room. And then just first off, you wouldn't have to sleep. You don't got to eat. You can work 24, 7, 30 days. He says, you would come out of that room with more to do. Because that multitasking monkey mind, when it gets one thing done, what does it do? Finds a new branch. And more branches, more branches, more branches. So he's like, at the end of the day, you don't need to get to the point of doing all these things. He said, you need to figure out what doesn't need to be done. What doesn't need to be done right now? Because you can't be calm inside and have that power if there's always something to do. Football was easy. I had to work out today, go to practice today, read my playbook. I'm good. When I got to this world, I'm like, I got all these things I could do. I want to do all of them right now. And it was all over the place. And the idea is I lost my calm power. Because I didn't think about what doesn't need to get done right now. It needs to get off the plate, we'll call it. Have I ever given you guys the, uh, the dogs in a pen about ideas, like the, the dogs that are in a pen concept? Yay, nay? No? Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> this is a, so I got two dogs. They're back there in the house barking right now. And I love dogs. And what I came to find is like my ideas. I love my ideas like I love my dogs. They're so amazing and they're cool and they're great. Look at all these cool ideas, right? And they go into my head. And what happens is I realize that sometimes it's like all the ideas, if they're, you know, these dogs, they're in a pen, a small pen, when they're sleeping, they can fit because they're just cool ideas. They're sleeping. No big deal. The dogs are sleeping. No big deal. But what if one dog woke up? What if one dog, what if maybe two of 10 dogs woke up? Well, these two dogs got nowhere to run, nowhere to play. The other dogs are laying around. And next, you know, all the dogs wake up. And then what you got? A bunch of crazy dogs jumping around like crazy monkey. All these crazy ideas. And what I found was we have way too many things that are in the back of our head that are all fighting for the space in that pen. And we never, never take this next step, which is really difficult, is imagine you have these 10 dogs. You love the dogs. Love the dogs. In order for some of these dogs to fit in this pen, some dogs need to be put to sleep. You feel that? Oof. Little head. Yeah, right? That's a thought I have like, oh. I'm telling you, it's the same with some of your ideas. Not that your dreams can't prosper and grow, but some ideas don't fit. When I was in college, I had this big idea. It's like, I want to do car stereos when I get out. Because I love car stereos back in the day because I wanted to be that, that annoying kid with the bass that would like rattle your windshield next door. And I, I did. I'm dead serious. Listen to this. When I, when I had my graduation party, I was so good with money back then. 
I got like eight, like 1200 bucks for graduation to go to college. I went to San Jose to the outdoor flea market and I spent $800 on car stereo equipment. My mom was pissed. <laughs> like, she's like, you returned, I returned all of it. She was livid, but I wanted that, right? I had these ideas. Say that to say when I was in college, had the same itch. And I was like, you know what? I want to go home. And when I get done with football, I'm going to open a business called Trucks's Trunks. Let that settle in a little bit. Trucks is trunks. So you put the subwoofers in the back of the truck and blah, 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 base, right? So like, here is an idea that doesn't belong in my head, to be quite honest. It's a cool idea, but like, I'm not going to do it. That idea needed to be put to sleep. And so I say that to say some of the ideas you have, you are not calm right now inside because this idea keeps bumping up against the other dogs and it doesn't have room to run around. And it honestly shouldn't be in the pen in the first place. So the thought should be, how do I get this idea out of my head and press it off into the future? Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to talk about the workers today and who closes the year strong. So as you guys have met, I know I'm a former NFL athlete. And so for me, I've played a lot of different seasons. I've done a lot of different stuff. I'm obviously any sports fans. Hands I can see anybody sports fans in here. Isn't it cool like if you have a team and they've been playing like they started so-so, they had a, like a slump mid-year, and then all of a sudden at the end of the year, they pick it up. And next thing you know, they go off and win like championships. Anybody seen that happen before? Like it's cool and like the whole ride is experienced. It's like a whole great feeling. And I just, ah, like there's something special about that. And I realized that is what a lot of us miss for our lives. We miss that, that the back of the year, like the year started strong. Let's go. Hey. And all of a sudden we get going. We kind of get into that flow. We have some wins. We have some losses. But at the end of the year, we kind of just like, let's wait for the beginning of next season, next year. Right. What if your team did that? If your team went, say, hey, at the end of the year, let's just wait for next season. You would hate that team. You'd be like, I'm not with those guys. Right. So we shouldn't do it for our lives to focus on how do we create a new momentum leading into next year to build up? Because here's what I do know. We are primed more than ever now to have such great opportunities in this world, because if you guys have noticed the world, like it's kind of it's kind of a little bit on shaky ground. And we feel unsettled sometimes. And so if we can lead in and go, hey, I'm ready to take over. It's a matter of you coming and being the stability you seek in this world. That's the thing. Can you create and be the stability you seek? So next year going forward, you have control. You're not like a leaf in the wind like we've sometimes felt in this world. So I'm going to today walk you through what for the last few years I've actually done. And I sat back and I was like, what, what do I do? Because I have a weird little process. I've never actually titled or named, but I just do every year because I, I actually look at the end of the year and go, hey, my body naturally goes, it's October, it's November, it's December. Let me go ahead and drink some more. Let me have a little more food. Let me just hang out. I want to get bundled up because it gets cold. And the next thing I know, it's like, oh, it's January and I'm more fat than I probably should be. Actually, <laughs> last year, this time I was, I started gaining weight. So by the end, December 31st of last year, I was 250 pounds. And I typically sit at 220. Like I, on three months, added 10 pounds per month. Like I wanted to set a record for some reason. So I know what this is like when I just let things go and lash. I'm like, never again, Anthony. So I'm going to tell you what I've been doing and what I stopped doing and also what I will do for the rest of my life ongoing. I'm not going to lie, though. It's kind of cool to sit around and not work out and drink bottles of wine. It's just, isn't it sometimes like you need that? You need that a little bit. I got some head nods. <laughs> so let's go into this. So I've, uh, I've titled this the R7 system. Let's hop into this. The first R is what I call review. And here's what I mean by review, a very hard look. Now, the hard look is not always easy to take. And to be quite honest, it's sometimes a little bit scary because I want you to take a look at your life, which you've been doing this entire year. And I want you to take an honest, a very hard look and go, hey, what have I been doing that hasn't been serving the vision, the dream, the mission of where I'm supposed to go? Because you set this intention at the beginning of the year. You said, I'm going to go here. It's going to be my life. I'm going to create this thing. And then somewhere along the line, if you're doing great, phenomenal. Take a look at what you can improve upon. But if you're not where you wanted to be, what did I, what did I do that wasn't great? Where did I slow down? And honestly, if you have a planner, go take a look at your planner and see where you wrote things in that didn't get accomplished or where you wrote things. And if you go back and look, you go, yeah, that was a waste of my time. Because if we don't review, it's that whole process of if you don't look at history, you're doomed to repeat it. So every time I complete one of my planners, I actually go back and I thumb through and I go, man, what did I, what did I have to, to do in my mind at the time, but not really have to do in real life, right? So review. And if you can't see something, here's what I do. I sit back and I ask people, hey, um, taking a look at what's going on in my life, what should I adjust or change? Like you could actually outsource this to other people. 
it's seriously something you could ask your, your wife, because sometimes your wife or your husband are really good at telling you what you wasted time on, right? Because like you were talking about doing that thing and you didn't get that thing done. So the big thing, first are review. And it should be something you go pretty deep on because I want you to be able to pull out areas where you can see that you shouldn't have done things and areas where you could have done better, been more precise, been more productive, been more focused. You could have been a high performer at a higher level, right? Review. The second R, reframe. Now, this is an interesting one because what we sometimes do is we look at these errors and what we end up having internally is this level of like of guilt, this level of, of uh, maybe a little bit of disdain or maybe a little bit of like shame or we're self-deprecating like, oh, you dropped the ball. You suck. Look what you you wasted time, Anthony. What, what was wrong with you? Right. And and what I do in that moment is I don't actually reframe, which is big to extract new information. Because the reframes, what a lot of us are missing, I find, it's not so much that you tried something and you didn't work out and you walk away. It's like, no, you tried something and didn't work out. Why? And what's the silver lining? Maybe you tried an effort towards something in a new social adventure you're trying to do and you created some stuff and it didn't pan out and you go, oh, I just suck at video. No, no, no. Maybe you don't suck at video. Maybe you could have adjusted how you spoke about something, the way you opened with the first three seconds of your hook, maybe how the video was framed. Maybe the topic itself didn't resonate with your people. Let's reframe what we gathered from this moment. Because if you review it and everything's bad and we feel bad, it's hard to press into the rest of the whole year and finish strong if the energy starts negatively. You ever try to do that, like to start like a new motion with like negative emotion? It's hard to create momentum, right? It's hard to get that going if I feel, uh, so the big thing is to reframe. And this is 100% where I go, hey, I had this take place. I noticed it didn't serve me, wasn't perfect. Let me go back and see how can I see this from a new perspective? Because I believe this perspective precedes enlightenment. The aha moment, right? A new perspective on a singular situation. If I can get a new perspective, I can go, oh, I didn't notice that. Okay, now that I see that, here's a new lesson, a new takeaway that I can use and apply going into the rest of the year. So when I get to these times of the year, I actually do typically sit back and go, okay, starting into the next year or into this year, what happened? What am I not seeing? What am I not noticing? Like, what are we not finding out or paying attention to? And then what happens is I can get to my wits end. I'll get to my level of what I can see. And here's where I, I definitively want you to do this. And it's going to sound odd, but if you do this today, it'll be a game changer. I want you to text or call a person who is close to you, who kind of knows your vision and dream. And I want you to share and say, hey, I took a hard look at my life and what I've been doing the last like, you know, seven, eight, nine months. And I noticed some things I haven't been doing or some things I tried that didn't work out. Can you hop on a phone with me or can you share with me what are some things of opportunity I'm not seeing? Where, where is there a positive that I, I'm not seeing in this situation? And obviously get your more optimistic minded friends, right? Hit your growth day community up like, hey, people, this took place because some people are just pessimistic and their, their life's not great. So they're like everything sucks. There's no positive. You don't want those people, by the way. Find the people that are joyous, right? So ask them, hey, what's, what, what can I not see? And it might be a phone call. It might be engaged in this community going, hey, you want to hop on a phone call real quick? I want to run some things by you. This took place. What am I not seeing, right? Because if you can reframe the moment, you can go, oh, I didn't notice that. Okay, now let me try this new thing. I'll try it this way next time. I get more hope. I get more energy. And now when you lead into the rest of the year, you actually have more of this positive emotion. There's not this drain or this disdain or this anguish of like, oh, man, it's all bad. No, no, no. I'm like, hey, opportunity, hope, joy. It's big. For me, family is a humongous anchor. I'm not going to give my whole story, but I grew up in foster care. I got adopted at a young age or like 14 years old. And then I had this really interesting like base of not having my family. And so when I got older and I could have my family, it's been this anchorage like to me. And, and I always wanted to give my kids something better than I had. I didn't have mom in the house. So I didn't have dad in the household. So for me, I, the fact that I get to wake up and my real kids are in my home is it's seriously every day. I'm like, it's super cool. And so while it sounds odd, it's not like, just enjoy it. I'm just going to talk you guys through some points that I have found in my journey to be things that have helped me become a better parent. Now, 
I became a dad at 19 years old. My oldest son just turned 17. In fact, uh, last Thursday, got his letter back from the University of Oregon of acceptance. So the school that I went and played football at, my son now has an opportunity to go run track at, which is Track Town USA. Hey, yo, um, super excited to get that one. He still has to get in for track track, but academically he's sound. But man, I pretty much went from being like a high school kid to dad. Like <laughs> I was telling somebody just yesterday, I'm like, man, I, I can't recall time without being a dad after high school. It's like I was a kid, I graduated high school, go to college. Oh, I'm a dad right now. And I've been a dad ever since. Now, here's the interesting thing. I've never not loved being a father. Now, I don't know if you have kids at all, or maybe you want to have kids. There's always been this anchor to me of like, ah, I love being a dad. When I found out that I was going to be dad, I was standing in the locker room. My, my fiance at the time had called and said, hey, I'm late. I went to Planned Parenthood. We're pregnant. And I, from that moment, I was like, yeah, <laughs> like I get to, I get to give back to a life in a way that wasn't given to me. Now, that being said, have I been a perfect parent? Absolutely not. I am sure I have jacked my kids up. I'm sure. It. I'm sure of it because they're, they're different humans with different ways to do things. But some of the things that I've learned through this journey of not just me navigating being a kid, having a kid, but also growing up and looking back and going, man, what would I have done different? What do I do now different than I did five years ago, six years ago? Because I also have 12-year-old twins that are same, I guess, kind of people, but vastly different. So I'm going to walk you through points I have today. and I'm going to share with you my perspectives. Now, that being said, I'm going to give you this kind of precursor. Some of the things I share are not going to sit perfectly, I'm sure, because we're all different. I do not believe there is a right or a wrong way to parent. I think that there are different ways to do different things. And I don't care what happens. You could be on your page a perfect parent, but because your kid is different, man, you may not fit with that kind of parenting style. What they need is a parenting style. So the idea is like if you kind of listen to these things, you may hear some stuff that goes, ah, it doesn't fit with me. And that's okay. I'm not going to go and put a torch in the ground and say, I'm sticking to this. You better do no i'm just giving you some thoughts and ideas so without further ado let's pop into this first things first you do not want to slave away so your kids can have everything now right you can write these out if you want you don't have to here's what i mean i find that in my area in most suburban areas in most areas people go i gotta work real hard i'm a slave away so my kid can do whatever they want to do in life and to an extent, I get this. You want to be able to fund your kids' dreams and create what you want to create for your kids. But I found in my journey, in my life, that I've watched people and I've watched multiple generations where that was the dad's mentality. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to slave away. I'm going to do my thing. I'm not going to chase my expressive dream. So I give my kids the hope and opportunity to go do more. Now, while you have the KDs of the world, right? The people who are like, my mom worked two jobs. I wouldn't play basketball professionally. Majority of people I found do this. They go and watch mom and dad slave away, do their job, and they think that's the way to do it because they're mimicking what they've watched somebody do. They watch them have these jobs and fight and battle with money and all these kind of things. So what happens is they do what they've naturally seen. So what I found is in my journey, I said, you know what? I want to change that. I don't want to do something just to do it so my kids have money so they can go to school or they can eat because I can find a way to feed them and take them to do what they want while also chasing a passion so my kids go, holy crap. That's actually possible. Like my kids have watched me on national television climb a wall on American Ninja Warrior. That is not something every kid can say they saw. But I, I in my heart of hearts believe because of that, my kids see things as possible outside of the norm. That, I believe, is how you give your kids a different perspective. You're going to get them to do what they want by showing you do what you want. So the idea is like, show them how to live with passion. Show them how to chase a dream. Don't be a detriment to their life. Don't push them away. We'll talk about that. But the idea is you have to live in a space beyond what your current comfortable space is if you want your kids to. So the best way to love them in a way, in my opinion, to go chase a big, huge dream is to go and chase a big, huge dream. Let them watch you stumble and fall. My kids have watched me stumble and fall and do dumb stuff. And, but they've also seen me be on stages and share and teach and talk. And when I'm in public, they go, man, like they see people walk up and go, hey, thanks for what you did. So that, I believe, puts a different seed in their heart. That's the first of many. Number two, do not rob your kids of their hardships. Repeating this one because you need to hear it. Do not rob your kids of their hardships. My kid... Tiz, my, he's the oldest son. His name's Anthony. We have a nickname of Tiz. Not going to tell you why it's his nickname, but there was a time back in middle school when he was getting picked on after school. And, and so he calls my wife, like this is a kid picking on me. My wife gets in a car, shoots down, doesn't tell me. And she's out there yelling at this kid. And I go, what happened? She goes, well, this kid was, you know, picking on him. So I wasn't going to let him, you know, do it to my son. Right. It's all oh, right. Mama bear. I totally get it. Totally get this. But here's what took place. She got down there. My kid never had the ability 
to manage this situation on his own. Now, I'm not saying that he should have been getting picked on, but I am saying I would have loved to have that conversation at home after the fact when that emotion sets into my son to talk about how do we navigate these moments? Because that hardship was robbed from him. He didn't have the ability to build the muscle so that he could say the right thing, handle himself, avoid the situation properly because mom came and saved the day. Now, it's okay for you as a parent to save your kids, totally get that. But there's got to be a line, a a demarcation line where you go, you know what? I'm going to let my kids struggle especially if you have the means to support your kids so they don't struggle with finances or food or a house to stay in, right? If you have the basics and foundation, well, how are they going to have the grit to get past the hard parts of life later on if they don't develop that now in your tutelage? So you can't rob your kids of these, these hardships they have. So I told my son, this is a, this is a one you maybe agree with and don't. I am not a proponent of ever instigating a fight. My kids, I tell them, you do not ever put your hands on people in any way. However, if somebody puts their hands on you, you better defend yourself. You've got it because if not, they'll do it again and again and again. So I said, if they touch you, physically touch you, you end it by taking care of this fight and the next hundred by going like a like a Tasmanian devil. You go crazy. I just don't hurt them and hit them, but you got to you got to handle yourself. So a couple of days later, I'd had a conversation with my son about, look, if this kid gets in your face, just leave, man, walk away. But if he touches you, you've been doing jujitsu, man, jujitsu his face, whatever. And so next thing I know, I get a call two days later. And my son got in trouble because he went to the office because this kid was pushing him around, physically pushing him. So next, you know, this kid's in a, in a neck hold on the ground and the teacher comes, gets him off. And I go to the I go to the school. I say what took place. I tell him what happened. I said, to understand it, I'll have a talk with my son. We had that talk at Baskin Robbins. Another reason we had it at Baskin Robbins, because I'm like, great, son. Now, guess what? That kid never bothered him again. In fact, the kid ended up becoming a buddy later on, weirdly, because, well, now this kid had some level of like respect for my son. So the idea is you can't rob the kids at a hardship because when they develop the skill sets to manage their life, now they get to this point of being the strong human being you want them to be. So don't take all the hardship away. Let them experience it and then help them understand how to navigate it better next time. This can be your day for personal growth. This can be that day you committed to and you remember and you go, that was the day I got myself a community. I got better coaches. I committed to making my life the absolute best that I could. This is that day. Make today your growth day. Click the button on this page and sign up right now.